I think it was when we found out they were harvesting Missouri walnut, which is where we're based, shipping it overseas, trimming it down to be veneers, applying it to particle board, shipping it all the way back, and then selling it as cheaply as possible. That it just seemed like the system was broken and we didn't want to feed that system more. We wanted to do it differently. And because we thought each of these products were special and could last, we want to make sure they were built like that. Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, I'm chatting with the founders of Artifox, Dan and Sarah Mirth. You may know Artifox from their Instagram drool-worthy workspace furniture and clever artifacts, perfect for a world where so many of us are struggling to find inspiration while working from home. According to their website, Artifox was born from their founder's need for a desk that was both aesthetically pleasing and provided a more functional and efficient work environment. And it turns out they weren't alone. If you aren't familiar with their products, you should definitely check them out because they are gorgeous. I'm curious to hear more about their company and what's next for them. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Dan and Sarah Mirth. Okay, kids, all the way from St. Louis, Missouri, please welcome Dan and Sarah Mirth. Dan and Sarah, welcome to Obsessed Show. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Hey, uh, I always love to start with origin stories, and we're going to dig into that. And because we've got two of you today, we get to do double the fun. But maybe before we do that, I'm really curious about the name, Artifox. What's, what was the origin of the name of the company? Sure. So the name came from wanting to create clever artifacts. So things that last a long time, but that had something unique or special that made it stand out from, you know, the desks or tables or things in our life from hundreds of years ago. Yeah. And it's always a kind of a, a search for, okay, what can you find that doesn't exist? So, you know, you have to do your brainstorming of all the names and we're trying to combine things and find these nice kind of clever solutions and um, I actually think Sarah kind of came up with this nice combination and it really stuck. And we were able to like, you know, find URLs that would work and like all those little things that you don't think of until it's like time to start searching and putting yourself out there. That's like, oh, I better, I better check all this stuff. Yeah. I love the name. Love the mark. I think it's, it's really cool. Um, I love seeing foxes in my neighborhood. We have some that, that wander around in here, kind of like a quasi urban space and we've got this little urban chicken coop that i had to build to like make sure it was fox proof so you know i have sort of a love-hate relationship with, <laughs> with the local foxes so far the fox is zero and my chickens all the points so we hope to keep that going but uh and you guys didn't hop on the call to talk about my chickens um so let's talk about your origin stories dan or sarah who wants to go first how'd you get into this space like you're running your own furniture company and you know spoiler alert i've read your bios so i have a little bit of background okay. on each of you so i've i've decoded where we where we got to this point from but who's gonna lead us off here i can jump in it's so i would say we really got started right after college i was working as an architect dan broke off to start his own creative agency and was looking for something that managed cords and screens and cables and all this tech clutter that we all have in our desks and on our workspaces but wanting it to be beautiful and clean and inspired to keep working every single day in that same space um but being in the architectural world and interior design, we knew what was out there. We knew how hard it was to get some of these designer pieces and how costly they could be as well. Um, but also Dan grew up, his family had a local furniture store. And so he grew up putting those pieces together in those showrooms. So decided yeah. <laughs> just to make our own products for that space. Right. You know, yeah. Having run my own creative agency, I feel your pain. Like when you're looking for like, <laughs> We need desks that are not going to break the bank, but also look really cool. So when the clients come in, they're like, Ooh, this is a cool space and not just like, oh, there's another room full of Ikea desks. So it's. And just know. works the way that you work, you know, that maybe you could prop your tablet up to face you if you need that in your day to day or that cables can come up without being such a mess below. Um, but you can jump in. Yeah. So like 
early on, uh, I was doing kind of contract work, you know, straight out of school, saw the benefits of working from home and just kind of in my own space all the time. And so I would just make my own furniture just out of kind of necessity. I just had stuff, access to equipment and materials. So I just really started building my own and just kind of outfitting my space just because it was what I like to do. And pretty quickly, you know, friends, family, um, visitors would say like, oh, hey, where'd you buy? Where'd you buy your desk? Where'd you buy your side table or, or your bed even? I was like, oh, I just, I made those because I could and I couldn't find the things that I really wanted. And the things that were really important to me were all those little clever solutions to just hide a cable here or hide a hard drive there or make sure that everything kind of just fit and work together in like a really symbiotic relationship. Um, and it kind of just you know, mm -hmm. snowballed from there. I think we realized from that how much each piece in your life and in your space matters to create the whole and to create this functioning environment for each of us. You know, I had this uh, really great professor, design professor at Purdue named Wendy Olmsted. Wendy, I don't know if you listened to the show, but you know, she told me when I was a senior, she was like, just buy pieces like one at a time if you have to and use milk crates if you have to, but wait and get the right piece for the right space. And I just love that idea. Um, and the thing that I think is so interesting about your furniture that honestly, I didn't catch right away, which tells you how subtle it is, is how well tech is integrated into these pieces where like it works with your phone and devices at the side table or on the desk and cord management. Um, talk to us a little bit about your philosophy when it comes to integrating technology with the furniture. I would say early on when we first launched, people always asked, why don't you embed this type of cable or this type of power source? Or why isn't it all built in? And what we wanted was to give people a flexible environment and space because we know how quickly tech changes and evolves. But these pieces are meant to last and to grow with you. Yeah. And, and you know, you, you see a lot of these pieces out there that are very either very specific or they're like overly tech and it becomes very like trendy and it becomes very disposable to where it's like, oh, now I've got a new computer. Now I got to trash that. And like, you know, some companies think that's great because it means you're going to come back and you're going to buy again and buy again and buy again. And, you know, that's not what we're after. We want something that's going to last forever and be just specific enough to fit you know, the technology that you have now, but know that it's going to change over time and say like, Hey, let's not over design something to say, Oh yeah, this fits this generation iPhone just perfectly. Let's be a little bit more agnostic and say like, let's make sure it fits all of these. And we know that that format's going to be similar and it's going to last a long time. So let's just make sure we're kind of, you know, conforming to for like general formats, not very specific things. Cause otherwise, you know, the product is made to last forever. And if it's function doesn't last forever, then you're just going to get in trouble. Yeah. And I think you guys, um, it, it seems like have strategically priced this too, where it's like, you know, this isn't the cheapest furniture I've ever seen, but it's also like pieces that I would expect to last a long time. Um, so talk to me a little bit about the balance, because I'm sure this is something that every furniture creator goes through, especially when they try to get to scale, which is like, okay, how do I make this the cheapest way possible? Do we, you know, do we offshore this? Do we send it? wherever to get made? Do we try to make it here? Like how do we balance the need for um, quality and costs and expenses and all those things? So ultimately you guys decided to be made in America. So I guess talk us through your thoughts around the production and costs and those kind of things. So when we first started, we went out to seek manufacturing partners that were fairly close to us. Being in the Midwest, there's a lot of makers and wood shops and people who still are producing things, which was the best education we could get because we knew how to design things. We knew what we wanted to make, but we didn't know how they would actually be created in a scale of more than one. So working with people very closely like that taught us a lot. And I think that was beneficial in the beginning, but what we realized from there was how important those manufacturing partners were for consistency and quality and the material, just overall quality of the raw material itself. And so we knew that people were 
I think it was when we found out they were harvesting Missouri walnut, which is where we're based, shipping it overseas, trimming it down to be veneers, applying it to particle board, shipping it all the way back, and then selling it as cheaply as possible. That it just seemed like the system was broken and we didn't want to feed that system more. We wanted to do it differently. And because we thought each of these products were special and could last, we want to make sure they were built like that. Yeah. yeah. So, sorry, Dana, if you were going to add stuff to that, go ahead. Uh, yeah, sure. I think, I think just some, some small additions there are, you know, it's not like we are against making things in different areas. It really is like what makes sense to make what thing where mm -hmm. that that's, what's important. Um, and as Sarah said, like making hardwood furniture, it should be made in the U S it should be made, you know, in proximity to the materials it's being made mm -hmm. of. What does your team look like at this point? You know, we're, we're still in a largely COVID space. It's, uh, it's the end of April, 2021. If you're listening to this far off in the future, um, just to timestamp, you know, most people are, lots of people are still working from home, but what, what's your team and structure look like and how are you guys balancing things during this? Um, we're still a pretty small team. There's seven of us, but we work with quite a few different manufacturers and makers and we like being that kind of lean team that we can turn quickly. Some of what we were proud of last year is how our whole team really banded together. And there were a lot of unknowns with suppliers and different things out there. And everybody was able to work really well together because we are such a tight team of people. What were some of your design influences? I can imagine coming from an architect and a graphic designer, um, you know, what they may have been, but <laughs> curious to hear what, what other things that you were looking at or what other things you were thinking of as you were designing these pieces. Yeah. I mean, uh, so my background was, is primarily graphic design, but like I even started, you know, like when I, when I left high school, I was going to be an engineer. Everybody told me you're going to be an engineer, you're going to be an engineer, you're going to be an engineer. And it was like, okay, cool. So I, I kind of started down that path and cause I just really liked structures and making things, but pretty quickly aesthetic and like, kind of like almost, almost brand and like message became more and more important to me and like very kind of simple and clean design really started to kind of infiltrate my aesthetic. Um, so I kind of always loved kind of, you know, the kind of Bauhaus stuff and, um, almost the, even like Japanese type design where it's like very minimalistic, but very intentional. Um, same thing with, you know, the, the Scandinavian design. So we've, we're kind of trying to like merge a lot of that stuff together, mm -hmm. um, and not like overdo it or, you know, add too many features to one thing. Um, but we do want to make sure if we can fit in like a little bit extra that we do to make sure you're not having to, you know, again, it's like kind of a Japanese mindset where it's like, you want things to, to do as many things as they can, but not be cluttered, not take up extra space. So I'd say like those types of um, kind of mindsets or design and aesthetics are, are the stuff that we really look to for, mm -hmm. for inspiration. Yeah, which is very architectural in the way of thinking as well. So they merged nicely. So I'm curious what you guys have seen over the course of COVID as everybody's working from home and, you know, some people are, you know, just trying to get through this and other people are like really in the nesting mode of like making their work from home space as cool and as comfortable as possible. Like what, what demands have you seen that have been different in the past 12 months than maybe at the start of the company? Um, I think we've seen a shift from a home office being a luxury to now being a necessity. And people are realizing that even if they start to go back into the office, it may not be fully back to the office or they want to be prepared to work from home in a way that actually is functional and comfortable and productive. We, in the beginning, we received so many orders of people who would write us messages saying, I'm working on a door on, you know, it's a milk crate. Yeah. <laughs> just like makeshift kind of old Ikea things or whatever, and that they were desperate to upgrade. So, so we thought that was kind of funny and they're funny stories to tell, but we had really great interactions with our customers who were just trying to get set up in a way that finally suited their needs. What is your hottest product right now? 
Uh, the walnut Desco too. Yeah, it is gorgeous. <laughs> I'd say the the matching bench is pretty sweet too. Yes. Yeah. There's actually one behind Dan in the corner if you can see yeah. over his shoulder. So if you're not on YouTube, kids got to <laughs> make it over to the YouTube feed at some point. Yeah. You can see it's the little house, corner of the bench there. desk. <laughs> yes. In our house, it's uh, the record player and... Like on a TV yeah. console. Ah, very cool. Um well, so this is more of a marketing question, but who's your customer? Who do you see most frequently buying and, you know, how are they, is it more work from home kind of spaces or are you seeing agencies outfitting their larger spaces with, with more of your stuff? We see both. Obviously right now work from home is dominant, but we see a lot of agencies, especially run by younger urban professional type people who are looking for something more special than just the white cubicles or, you know, something that doesn't have a story behind it. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely see it's people that care about their environment being important to their process. And a lot of times it's, it's more like creative professions. Um, but we've noticed a kind of a shift into other professions that, you know, see the value of creativity, whether it's, whether it's a law firm or, you know, a financial advisor, they want to create an environment that, you know, fosters that creativity and they see, they see, you know, our products as being, you know, something that can help kind of foster that creativity. Are there any of your products that are, um, were especially surprising to you? Like ones that you didn't plan for initially, you've got like this really cool pencil tray and like some cable management stuff. I'm just curious if there's anything that after you launch the company, you're like, Oh, you know what we need is this, like any surprise products. Um, I'll say, so some of our small products, like our magnetic products, like our, our pegs, have you seen those, which is just, you know, this little Lego block that has these, you know, bookends that you can pop out. Um, that was a really surprising, you know, product that we weren't really looking for. It just kind of happened while we were just kind of creatively experimenting and playing with different materials and, you know, magnets has always been something that you can, if, if used properly can be very subtly effective. And, uh, we just kind of made some of these things real quick and explored them. And it was like, Oh my gosh, this is, this is so much fun. Mm -hmm. Like it's aesthetically pleasing. It's functional, but it's just really fun to like play with them. We see people playing with them all the time and talking about, Oh, my kid loves just, you know, messing with these things. You know, I've uh, talked to a lot of CEOs and founders and um, creative directors on the show and, I'm always curious, you know, I I've learned that there's no such thing as a typical day for anyone, but like what, what might a typical day look like for you guys? And especially in this dual role, like who's doing what are you, are you both doing all the same things or do you kind of like share the brain? Or are you both doing very distinctly different things? Pretty different things with some definite overlaps here and there. You know, when big decisions come around, we both have to obviously put our heads together. Um, but on my side, it's most of the kind of creative problem solving when it comes to the products and what we're going to design and what what I think will kind of be the cool next big thing. Um, and then, you know, as we decide on those things together, then me kind of diving deep into like, okay, what, how is it going to what's the engineering of this going to be like? What are the details? What are the materials that we're going to use? How are we going to actually make this thing, you know, break down and be reassembled and how many times can it do that? And we want to make sure that those things are lasting and like solving all those little problems. Whereas Sarah is more, you know, operationally focused and says like, Oh, can we actually make that thing that you want to make? I got to, I got to be the one that talks to the factories and organizes all of this. And it's like, Oh, I see you want to do that, but that's going to be too expensive. So She's kind of doing a lot of the business side and, you know, reining things in, in here and there. Mm -hmm. Yes. I call myself the editor sometimes to his designing, but it's business development, really marketing, and then the branding from my perspective. Very cool. Um, so when you're not doing the things you have to do, what are the things, what are your favorite things to work on right now? We work on our product products and projects pretty often. And what's, what's good about that is good and bad, I guess, is that we actually really like working on these things. Like we started making these things because we wanted to make them, not because there was a job opportunity 
around them necessarily. It was again, like going back to our origin, you know, I was making these things because I, I wanted them. And a lot of the things that we make is because we want them and we see value in our home, like the bench back here, you know, that was a thing that was like, man, we really need something for this space. And it wasn't even what we were working on at the moment. I just kind of threw together a sketch and then was like, Hey, you guys want to see this? (laughs) Yeah. Well, and so some background information there is that we have been renovating a 130 year old home in the city of St. Louis. And so we cut it all the way down to the studs and started from scratch basically. Um, And so we've been able to really think through every space of the home from that perspective. And then what pieces would ideally suit those environments. I'm assuming this is not the 130 year old home that you're in right now. It is. It is. is. Wow. Yes. (laughs) Because it, well, I'm sure Zoom is giving us a little bit of a white box look in the background, but like, it's just super clean and looks perfect. It is, it is very clean and white. Mm-hmm. And um, even today we had a HVAC guy come in and he goes, wow, this is so white. <laughs> and person, that was a good thing or a bad thing. And he was like, I really like it. He's like, I'm about to move and buy a new place. And I really want to like make it look like this. <laughs> um, so this question is for each of you. Um, do you have a proudest professional moment that you'd like to share? I think for me, it was really when we first launched and people trusted us with these big purchases and they had never heard anything from us. We weren't anywhere. We were totally unknown. And we felt the weight of that responsibility of those first orders and making sure they were done right. And it was proud and it was a challenge and it was just a really great first experience for us. Yeah. I mean, I would have to say pretty much the same thing. Um, because that early on phase, and you probably know this too, as like a, as a graphic designer or like a brander, like you do that for like all these big brands that you assume know what they're doing. You know, (laughs) they know everything about everything that they're working on. And so when you're doing it for yourself, you're like, do I know as much as those huge corporations that I've been making things for in the past? And so you do all the same things. You go through the same process, the same creative process, and you make all the same assets but you're making them for yourself and you're going to, you have to be like the, the client, you know, and the designer at the same time. And that's pretty tricky. And when we put it all together and then kind of put it out there and got a really good reception, it was like, okay, you know, this actually Mm -hmm. worked. Um, and we can, we can do this. We can make this happen. You know, I, I've heard this over the course of the last even 10, 15 years, designers talking about, <clears throat> you know, what we should launch our own product. We should come up with our own thing, whether it's digital or physical or, you know, furniture or just selling, you know, graphic assets. Um, <clears throat> was, was this a plan of yours kind of all along that you wanted to launch your own products or did this, I know you, you mentioned it kind of came out of your own need, but was the idea of launching your own product line something that you guys had talked about well before it happened. We were interested in running our own business and Dan was already doing that with his agency, which was growing and it was doing great. And so really this was kind of a side project at the time. And I was looking for something worth making a big change. And once we saw people's reaction to the products and how excited they were, it just seemed like it all kind of clicked that it was worth doing and worth investing in. And then it's grown so much from there. Yeah. So it really, really came from us really wanting to do our own thing and make our own things um, and work for ourselves. So, you know, once you kind of put all those together, it really is the kind of obvious ending to that path is to start making your own products and marketing yourselves and kind of building a business around that. Now, are either of you still doing professional work outside of Artifox? No, no, we, I, you know, we kind of work on other kind of little projects that are ours and like our, our owned um, entities and projects, but you know, nothing, no, no, client no clients, yeah. no, you know, no employment, you know, outside of our own things. Would that process look like, was it, like, let's launch and see what happens and see if we need to wind down our other roles or was it, you know, burn the ships <laughs> and go on to Artifacts and hope it works? Well, I quit. 
I quit my job before we had even sold a single product. So we just kind of went for it. Dan, obviously being agency projects, it was a lot more flexible to work around. Yeah. And that like slowly phased out. And, you know, some of those relationships continued into other bigger kind of companies that, you know, I've helped build, um, but in a very just different, different way. Very cool. Sarah, I love that you just were like, yeah, I quit. I'm, I'm going to make this work. <laughs> It was somewhat painful when we did it. Well. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dan, you mentioned earlier some influences like between Scandinavian and Japanese design. I'm curious if if either of you have like specific design heroes or um, brands or people that, that you looked up to kind of coming up in the biz. Yeah, um, I definitely do. Um, I really like there's kind of one standout and it's, it's kind of, you know, I don't know, it's probably every industrial designers answer maybe. Um, but Dita Rams is, is someone that I've just always, even, even not knowing, like if I would just see a product, not knowing that it was his, I'd be like, Oh, I really love that. Who made that? Dita Rams made that. Um, or, or, or even like, you know, some, some marketing materials that grew out of his kind of creative team. Um, all, you know, when you can look at Apple and so much of what Apple does, mm -hmm was based off of what kind of he set up, you know, I think even, you know, Ives always says like, gives some credit to Dita Rams's work with like Brown early on. And, um, that's always just been someone that I've just loved almost everything he puts out and it's very simple, very intentional, you know, even his kind of rules of design are things we look to all the time. And even people, you know, we'll come up with the same solutions after working on it a long time. It's like, Oh, you're just coming up with the same solutions that the Dieter Rams came up with a long time ago. So <laughs> that's, that's definitely one of my top kind of people that I look to. Is there anybody you'd add to that list? Definitely. Mine are more architects, but they, I would say I was really interested in Tadao Ando early on in my education because of all of his really clean concrete structures. It was so different from anything we saw really around St. Louis, but also from a residential perspective. And I think there are a lot of great residential architects who've taken these kind of modern theories and ideas and turn them into homes, which is very exciting to me and interesting. And then obviously Charles and Ray Ames, we love because they were able to design so many different things, but do it well. And just from a similar design thought process. So listeners, I'm curious who your guess was uh, when Dan said, maybe everybody's going to say the same thing because I was going to go with Eames if I had to guess what you were going to say. So um, Dieter Rams is a good one too, obviously. Um, so this is a question that I've asked everybody that's ever been on the show. Um, as designers, as architects, like we are all just obsessed with so many things, I feel like, which is sort of the title of the show. Um, I'm curious what each of you find that you're most obsessed with right now. And it can be life. It can be design. It can be something totally related to art, unrelated to what we're talking about, but just curious what you find you're most obsessed with right now. Well, I would say like most people, we've spent a lot of time at home over the last year. And so even though we'd already been renovating it prior to COVID, I think COVID really forced us to sit in it and think about every single detail and every single piece in our home. Anything from our really interesting teapot that we just got all the way to... We have an urban small lot and a garden that we've planned out every single plant and where it is and when it will bloom and how it will interact with the others. So I think that whole experience of the way that we live has been an obsession of ours over the last year. Yeah. I mean, even, even more than the last year, the past like four years, you know, when we kind of acquired this home and knew that it was a, you know, gut rehab, every choice had to become very, very intentional. And, you know, luckily with Sarah's architectural background, um, she was able to lay out a plan for this that makes what was once a like two family, two tiny family, two story, very small city home, extremely functional and as functional as more modern homes are. 
And through that, you know, what really has become like a four year process of very intentional decisions, we kind of created an experience that on a daily basis is very like rewarding and rejuvenating, you know, everything from like, you know, where our room's located to waking up to our bathroom's located for getting ready to where like you come down and you have your breakfast and you walk through our yard to our garage that we built from scratch. Um, like that whole sequence and process has been something we've been literally obsessed with for, I would say the better part of the last four years. And it's just now kind of finishing up. And it's like any design that you and process that you go through, it's hard to kind of really know exactly what it's going to be like until you're towards the end of it. And as it is coming to fruition and you're seeing it come, you know, kind of manifest, it really is exciting. And so you know, we're even like more obsessed with it at this moment of like completion. <laughs> Very cool. Um, so maybe this is a question you can't answer for us, but I'm curious if you have anything that's kind of on the product roadmap or even like dream projects for Artifacts, like dream products that you'd like to create that, that have not seen the light of day yet. We have a lot of those <laughs> that we don't necessarily want to share yet. <laughs> But we have some interesting collaborations that we're working on behind the scenes. You know, it's just me, you, and a few thousand of my <laughs> closest friends. <laughs> yeah, I'll let Sarah kind of take the lead again. Like she's always the one kind of got to reel everybody in to make sure <laughs> we're we're going down the path. But um, I mean, we want to we want to continue to expand into different spaces. You know, we really focus on your workspace a lot. And with like our bench and our table, we're saying, okay, we're taking some of these ideas and pulling them into new spaces. You know, the bench was like the beginning of our entryway. So we want to kind of expand on that ecosystem. And the table kind of comes more into, you know, um, a meeting space or a dining space. And so, uh, you know, coincidentally, and like kind of serendipitously, we, we were working on that during COVID and saying like, oh my gosh, this is kind of perfect to say, here's a workspace that is dual purpose. You know, you can, this can be your kitchen table, but it can also be your, your desk. Um, so moving into those spaces, we really want to mm -hmm. expand. Well, and I think that just gets back to how much work is changing and evolving and that I think our customer base and people who follow us on Instagram, they really care about the work that they're doing and that work could happen anywhere. And they just want to be enabled to do the best that they can. You know, another thing that I think designers see, you know, once you're sort of indoctrinated into design is <clears throat> you just see everything differently. It's like, you know, in, um, the matrix, when you take that one pill, like you just forever see the world differently. I'm curious if there's anything, any trends or any things that you guys see in products right now that just kind of drive you crazy. Like anything that just really is bugging you <laughs> that you'd like to see done differently. Um, I mean, count countless things probably, but I mean, some specific things is, you know, this kind of workspace has become a bandwagon in which everybody's trying to jump onto and they're making things that are, you know, just trying to make a quick cash grab for this work from home time. And so a lot of that is kind of annoying, obviously, because they're kind of treading in our space that we've put so much time and effort and thought into. Um, one thing that's maybe controversial is that we get asked all the time about sit to stand desks and we don't offer one and we're always asked why. And we've come from a studio and architectural background where we always worked from standing desks, but with stools and your body was what sat or stood, or you're the one who's meant to move, not your desk. <laughs> and so it's been funny to explain that to customers and just people. And they always respond and say, oh, yeah, I never thought about it like <laughs> that. So that's really funny. I have a standing desk that I'm at currently sitting at a stool. <laughs> so I, I just push the stool and when I want to stand. So I exactly. come from an architecture background, I just sort of figured it out. Like, I don't want to pop the desk up and down. Like if I had just found a tall desk, this would have solved the problem. Yep. Yeah. Um, I'm curious if either of you have favorite pieces of advice like that you have received or some of your favorite advice to pass along to team members. 
I actually tend to say don't listen to advice <laughs> or to to take in people's advice and then filter it through your own perspective because one person's experience will always be different from your own and you know more about your situation and or the design challenge or whatever it is at hand. So to always kind of take that with a grain of salt. That's a good one. I would say something that I've, especially like when I was younger as a designer, um, that I really, I think really pushed me to become better and, you know, more talented was to, to never say no. If someone comes to me and says, Hey, have you ever done a website? I can do it. Yeah, I'll do it. Have you ever done a video? Yep. I'll, I'll do it. I can figure that out. And like through that stuff and, and telling them that you can, it's not like trying to give yourself something to do. And it's like, Oh, I'm going to give myself this goal. The second you put that out there in the world, especially to like a client or something, you don't really have a choice anymore. So you have to figure it out and you're really held accountable. And that like accountability makes you, you know, really push hard, kind of past the limits that you would have maybe given yourself to figure out something new. And through all of those experiences, whether it's going to be something you're going to do continually or not, you gain new insight to, you know, those next projects that you do, where maybe you have to hire somebody that's going to do a video or a website, and you now have a little bit of insight to be able to work with them. And so your ability to work with people just gets that much better. Yeah, I think that's great. I think that kind of adds to um, the curiosity that I think is so important for designers to have, um, you know, the, to want to dig in and learn about the thing that they haven't learned about before to want to dig in and try to find solutions that they haven't had to do before. Um, I think that's so very valuable. Um, before we wind down here, I'm curious if you guys have any asks of our listeners or anything you'd like to challenge our listeners to do differently. Well, we always, ask people or offer to people that to really take a look around your environment and really consider the things that you surround yourself with and think about which ones matter and which ones don't. And that some small changes really could make your life have more clarity or more productivity or things that matter to you. Um, I think a lot of people that aren't in design forget how much your environment crafts your day every day. Yeah. Yeah. I think your kind of way I always look at it is like your, your physical space is almost like, you know, it's a physical manifestation of like, you know, your mindset and vice versa. And the two really play off of each other. And even though it might not seem like it's affecting you, it, it probably is. And, you know, doesn't mean you have to go out and, you know, buy the super nicest stuff of everything, but pick the things that really matter to you and invest in them and kind of get rid of all the superfluous stuff that is unnecessary. Yeah. I think especially when it comes to clutter, like, you know, it's just so natural for us. Like when we're in a crazy period, like our spaces reflect that in that our stuff is just all over the place. <laughs> and I think being able to like pause and go, okay, take 10 minutes and tidy this up a little bit. I think, you know, for me personally, Maybe that's my, my OCD showing, but uh, <laughs> I think that helps a lot. Um, Dan and Sarah, tell us where our listeners can find more about the two of you and about Artifacts online. Our website is theartifacts.com and that is our Instagram handle as well. Very cool. Are you, are you guys in any retail stores or is everything everything's online? Everything's online. Very cool. Well, again, as I said, sort of the top of the show, it's just gorgeous stuff. So guys, if you haven't checked that out, be sure to head over to Artifox and check out uh, all their products. Um, Dan and Sarah, it's been great having you guys and your 130 or however old your <laughs> house is that looks great for its age. I just want to <laughs> reinforce that. It's been awesome having you guys on the show. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. And the kind words. Yes, of course. Well, thanks for being here and thank you for being obsessed with design. Okay, kids, that's episode 159 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. 
Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.